We just welcome everyone online. May the Lord bless you and keep you in all your ways. Hallelujah. Amen. I love that song, man. It's an awesome song. I'm not into the song of the boom bands. I used to do that when we used to go to the clubs in the bad old days. But now, I like, I like my worship to have meaning. Isn't it? Yes. When I sing a song like that, it has meaning. It draws me into the presence of God. Hallelujah. I want to continue this morning. Uh, I want to continue to... Uh, The Lord been speaking to me on being obedient to His Spirit. And uh, I want us to know that we live in a time where God wants us to really, really believe in the Word of God. Like never before. We have to be very, very um, sensitive to what God is saying in this day. So I want to continue with uh, being obedient in, in uh, relation to the Word of God this morning. And uh, something that provoked the, the message was a dream that God gave me on... Um, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you what God has been showing me. And I pray with all my heart that God will change his mind and, and step in. And, but I know he'll protect us. But what I've seen, let's pray that it wouldn't come to pass. Even if it comes to pass, I believe that God will protect us. But for those that are lost... And in this dream, I saw a time that is coming upon the earth. A time where the people have been sidetracked and people have, have forgotten about the situation that is at hand. And, and God took me into the future, the very near future. And he showed me a time where even food is going to become a luxury. Where they, you'll have money. But it won't be available. And I pray, as I said, I pray with all my heart that God will spare this nation and this world of this time. But He promised if we will obey Him and if we will trust Him. And I'm not preaching fear to you, I'm just telling you what the Lord showed me. And, and it was a time where, even in the house of God, the house of God was a place where, and you will see this come to pass. And this is why churches need to open their doors more now than ever before. In the past, the churches used to be a place of spiritual feeding, where people came to church to receive physical food. There is coming a time in the future where the church will be giving food to its people, natural food. That's how bad it's going to be. And, but the Lord promised me that if we will trust Him and if we will believe in Him, He will sustain us through this time. So I want to tell you all that many, many of the things that I have accomplished was God always speaks to me through dreams. And on Thursday night, He spoke to me very clearly. I even saw myself. I saw someone coming to the church and I went to the back into our storeroom and we had the storeroom and we had food in the storeroom. And, and someone came and I was going to measure five kgs of rice to give them. That's how bad it's going. And uh, this is what the Lord has been showing me. So, you as an individual, let the church, you see, this is, uh, we, need, we need not to be fear of the things that God reveals to us, but we need to be wise and prepare accordingly. Because we are the children of God. In the days of old, the, the Bible speaks of times when, when bad things happen and, and uh, famine hit the land. But God's people were always warned of it. Amen. So, take this word, pray on it, prepare accordingly. And uh, we'd rather be prepared. We'd rather be prepared than be unprepared. Amen. Amen. I already between the lines what I'm telling you this morning. If God has mercy on us and, he, and this thing will pass, so be it. Thank God for that. But if it does not pass, be ready for that. Amen. Amen. So be wise. Wise in what you do. Wise in the way you prepare. Listen to what God is saying. And I am doing it in my family. And I, as a family of God, I'm just telling you, I'll just be wise because there's coming a season where you'll have money, but they won't be available to buy. Things are going to get bad. And let's pray that God will not allow that to come 
Amen. But even if it comes, He has given us the wisdom and He's given us the grace to go through it. Hallelujah. Sometimes we need a little bit of uh, fear that comes with the revelation of God. Amen. But I am one who lives by the revelation of God. I don't live by chance. And um, God has always warned us. Even before the, the, the coronavirus hit us in, in March, you can ask all our staff. One day I was sitting in my office and the Lord spoke to me and I called everyone. And I told him, get ready, prepare. Remember guys who, who, who works, who was here? I told him, get ready. God said that we need to be wise with our finances. And within, when that was early March, by the end of March, we had locked up. So I'm just saying, this is what the Lord has showed me. So anyway, having said that, I, I want you to say that to bring some fear in your heart. <laughs> so now when I, when I preach on obedience to the word of God, you're going to take it serious. Hallelujah. We have to take it serious. These are serious times that we live in. Align to the word of God. That you find yourself where the grace of God abides. And so, I want to take our attention. As I said, I'm speaking on obedience to the word of God. How important it is. Um, the, the Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 17, uh, 10, chapter 10 or 17, it says that faith cometh from hearing and hearing the word of God. Hallelujah. Faith cometh from hearing and hearing the word of God. So the, the word of God, sometimes we want, we want faith. We want to have faith when things start happening in our life. But the Bible is telling us a different story. It's saying that the more you hear the promises of God, the Bible is the promises of God, and the more you focus on the Word of God and the promises of God, your faith starts to grow. How does your faith start to grow? It's the more you, you ponder and meditate on what God is saying rather than what the world is saying. Your faith grows. In today's world, there's many voices speaking. There's many rumors and, and of fear, and the root of it is fear. And we need to start to turn to the word of God and the promises of God in this day. Because many times the words of man have power over us. Why? Because the word of God is so scarce in our life. We don't meditate on it good, uh, long enough and hard enough that the words of man, even young people, you know, your friends will tell you, oh, maybe you, you're fat or maybe you, are, you, you, you can't speak properly or you look funny and you're off. Somewhere. And that words have power in our children. It torments them. It, 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 it makes them believe who they are. Sometimes spouses have that power over each other. And when we speak words in anger, we, we make them believe that. And yet we, we are so quick to accept the words of man. Have you ever been in a fight and you said something to your spouse? Those words carry power. You may have forgotten that fight, but those words linger on for a long time. And, and we tend to believe the words of men. We tend to believe what we hear around, what we are seeing. But what about the word of God? What about what God's word is saying? And this is what the Bible is saying. That's where faith is birthed. Faith is birthed when you take the word of God and you do not doubt it. And I believe that we live in a time such as that. Where we have to just believe. Because the word says, and I will believe it. And I will never doubt it. I don't, need, I don't need it to be proved to me. I don't need logic. I don't need a sign or a miracle. It is just because it is written. Can this world have that kind of power in your life? I believe we live in those days where people are going to speak, but you just, God says so, and I just believe it. I don't need to prove it. I don't need to find logic in it. It is written. And I'm going to run with it, and I'm going to trust God. This is how we need to live in a time such as this. I don't care what you think. I don't care where you are, what's going on in your life. But if the Bible says so, it is a time where we need to hold on to God's word and never ever look back. Amen. I believe we're in that time now. We have to listen to what the book of Hebrews says. The book of Hebrew in Hebrew chapter 10, verse 11. And it starts, the, the famous uh, chapter on faith, and it starts in verse 1, and it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. And it's speaking of things that you do not touch or feel, but you, 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 you have faith and you possess it. And we learn that faith comes from what? From hearing the word of God. So the more you believe in the promises of God, the more faith you will have. And it is by faith that we possess the things of God. And listen to what it goes on to say. And the entire chapter 11 speaks of, a, of all the great patriarchs of the Bible. 
Like it starts with, with the fate of Abel and Enoch. And it goes on. The whole chapter of 11. By faith Noah did certain things. By faith Abraham did. By faith Sarah gave birth to a child which was barren. By faith Abraham possessed and became a father of nation. By faith Jacob uh, did what God called him to do. By faith Moses delivered the nation. By faith um, uh, the Passover was held by faith. The walls of Jericho came down. And it goes on. You read the, 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 the 11th chapter of Hebrew. And it goes on to say, By faith Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and also David and Samuel and all the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obeyed promises, and stopped the mouths of lion, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness, were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead that were raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, and they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials and mockings and scorchings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. And it goes on, and it says that all of these people that we read about in the book of Hebrew chapter 11, all the great names in the Bible, there was only one reason why they fulfilled what they did in their life was because they believed the promises of God. They believed the word of God was yes and amen in their life. That was all. It didn't matter whether they, uh, how much tithes they gave in church. It didn't matter how much offering they gave. It didn't matter how much they fasted and how much they prayed. It just was an amount. Of, uh, it came down to, did they believe what God said was going to happen? If God said that I have blessed you, I'm going to bless you. If God says that, yes, there's a season, as I told you, there's a season of difficulty coming to the earth. But if you will trust me, and if you will walk in my ways, I will protect you. And I will put a, a Shekinah glory around you. God said it as a promise. Amen. And this was the only reason that all these great men and women of God have accomplished what God has called them to do. is because they trusted in the promises of God. Amen. The word of God must become the standard of your life. Unconditional. Unshakable. Unmovable word of God. In your life, that's where we are. If God said that, God said it. Just live it. Just believe it. If God said that, if you will trust me, I will never leave you and never forsake you. Do you believe that? Amen. Yes. This was the only thing that separated these great men of God and women of God. They believed. When, when, when Hannah was trying to put a child, she believed that God would give her a child. She didn't believe whatever everyone else was saying. She trusted in the promises of God that it came through. And all these great men, when Abraham was, when God told him to go to Canaan and I will bless you, he had to leave his family. He had to trust the word of God above the words of man, above the words of his family. This is not a season to live, to gain the favor of people around you. This is the season to gain the favor of God. Amen. We need the favor of God. And the only way you gain the favor of God is when you take him by his word. Never doubt his word. Never try to understand it. Just take it. It is written. Amen. Amen. I hear people uh, always trying to convince the word of God. I guess me as a preacher, I'm always every Sunday, I'm just always trying to convince you all of the word of God. But we have to get to a time in our life where we just take it. Amen. It is written. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's, let's look at some scriptures and then I'll get into what I want to speak this morning. If you look at the book of uh, Second Timothy, Chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible speaks of a time uh, where the Word of God, it, it speaks of the nature of the Word of God. Can we get that up? It's the second book of Timothy. I was telling my wife this morning that my Bible needs a uh, hospital. It's like all over the place. Pages are falling out. And I don't want to depart from my Bible. I like my Bible. It's got all my notes. I can't get a new Bible. Hallelujah. Second book of uh, Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. The Bible says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may, com may be complete, thoroughly equipping for every good work. So it's saying that the word of God has a function in your life. It's not just there for the pastor to preach. It is meant for you. 
And it is for you to, it's for the good works of the kingdom of God. It's for to fulfill the purposes of God in your life. Amen. And so we have to believe this word. It's not just a, a textbook that we come and preach and teach to. We as an individual need to take these promises and continually remind ourselves of the promises of God so that when the world is speaking, it's like now when people speak to me, oh, you know, you got the, they got these rumors, oh, this is happening and that is happening, and I just like reject them. It may be true, but I choose to reject them. I choose to believe what my Bible says. My Bible says that if you will trust me, if you will believe me, I will never forsake you and I will be the lamp unto your feet and the light unto your path. I like this section. I'm going to preach here. <laughs> because they must follow me to what I'm saying. I'm going to turn my pulpit and preach to them. <laughs> that's what the word of God says. If you will trust me, if you will believe me, that's all you need to know. I don't know. I don't know how God's going to do it. But I know that when, when the lockdown happened, people were in, in, uh, in uh, fear. They were, some people are still in fear. But I, I just walk right through it with my family. Yeah. This church walked right through it. Yeah. I don't know how God did it. But I know when he spoke to me in, in March and he told me, do this, do that, and I will protect you. I did that and I did this and he was there. Yeah. So it's not about, you see, we spend our whole life trying to understand how we're going to do it. Rather than just letting God be God. And you believe in Him. Hallelujah. And so this is what the, the Bible says in the book of Timothy. That the Word of God has a function in your life. To guide you, to teach you of the promises of God. That when the world is speaking, you're going to say, you know the scripture. Isn't that so? You must know the Bible to counteract the lies of the enemy. When fear comes into your heart. When, when uh, anxiety comes to your knock on your door. You must know how to fight this thing. Amen. I'm going to get there later. The word of God in the Psalms 119 verse 105 says, The thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God has a function in your life. It teaches you the promises of God. We have to get past listening to the words of man in this season. Amen. James chapter 1 verse 22. It says that we should be doers of the word. And not just hearers of the word. Hallelujah. Is it coming up? Yes, we've got to be doers of the word. Not just hear it, but do it. So what I'm saying is, the word of God is the promises of God. You can't just live your whole life listening to it, but never doing it. If, if you believe in the promises of God, you should do it. You should believe it. And you don't need to explain it to anyone. You see, that's a good thing. There is no need for you to explain your faith to anyone. You just need to love it. You just need to believe it and stand and walk in it. Yeah. And we spend our whole life trying to convince everyone around us of what we believe. God never called us to do that. God called the preachers to do that. That's the preacher's job. Let the preachers do that. That's my headache. To convince everyone that God is God. I'll continue doing that for the rest of my life. Because that's what I'm called to do. But that's not your job. You don't need to prove to your family that your God is God. You just need to love, love in Him and embrace in Him. And they will see the might of God in your life. And we do that all the time. We just need to be doers of what God said so. When I was a young Christian, I want to convince everyone around me. I want to show them what the Bible. I use the Bible as a tool to prove who God is to them. And then I just got a secret. The Bible was never meant for that. The Bible was meant to transform me. Before transforming the, the people around me. Through me, not through this, you see. And we think that I'm going to tell someone, but the word of God says so. It means nothing to an unbeliever. That's what Paul said. The word of God is foolishness to those that are perishing. But to those that are believing, it is the power of the gospel. And then I learned that the, one of the most powerful revelations in my life, that this word was meant to change me first of all. Before I can go preach to people, before I can go and be righteous and judge people, this word was for me. I had to learn to believe this word. And then, and then I started to realize something. As I totally and wholly believed in everything that this Bible says, it transformed me. It put faith in me. It changed my life. It brought forth the promises of God. You see, this Bible is for you. 
It is to make the promises that God has promised you to come to pass. It's to make you believe in the promises of God so that you can possess what God has for you. Amen. And when you start to walk in what God has for you, people around you start to see God in you. Hallelujah. And that way, you don't offend anyone. You just know it's simple. And we misunderstood it. We want to use the word of God is only used by the minister to teach the people. Even me as a minister, first this word must become in me, I must believe this word. I must trust it. I must learn to do this word. I can't just read the scripture. That's why I always tell my sons when you're preparing for messages for Sunday, God never called us to take a Saturday off and start, okay, now let me prepare a message to come and preach. Then you are being judgmental towards God's people. The word of God must already be in your heart. It must already have ministered to you as a minister. And you come and tell the people what has been in your life. That is the right way. You see, Jesus, oh, you get, you get a revelation now. Jesus said, I am the Word. Yes. He was the Word. He lived the Word. The Word was in Him, therefore, He could manifest it. That's how important the Word of God is. It carries the promises of God. Luke 11 28 says, Blessed are they that hear the Word and keep it. And if you read, if you put up that scripture in Luke chapter 11 verse 28, if you read before that, Jesus was doing mighty signs and wonders there. And a lady came up to him and said, But blessed is the womb that born, but gave birth to you. And Jesus retaliated with that and said, But blessed is him who hears the word and do it. So what he was saying is, it doesn't matter about the gift that God has given me. As a minister, as a worshiper, it doesn't matter, sis. Because God has given us these things. We never asked for it. We never did anything that was given to us. Yes. But he says more over than that. Blessed is a man that hears the word of God and does it. So it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you own. It doesn't matter what God is doing. Everything you have in your life is because God has given you. Some have an anointing in business. Some have an anointing at work. And you're getting promotions. And you've got a top job. It's because God has given you that gift got nothing to do with you. Amen. And Jesus was telling this lady, I can't be focused on myself. She was trying to bring the focus to Jesus and say, oh Jesus, you are so anointed. Your mother is blessed to give birth to you. She wanted to make it about Jesus. But Jesus turned the whole thing and said, it's not about me. It is about the God that I serve. Amen. It is about the word of God. That is the power of God's word by doing what I tell you to do. And in this season, there's no time to justify why you do things. If God spoke, like now I told you, God spoke to me, I got a word of God. And I'm blessing you all with it so that you all can prepare. But whether you're prepared or not, is your decision. But as for me and my house, we're going to obey the word of God. And that's how we live the word. If I read today, the Bible says, as for me and my house, we we'll serve the Lord. My, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm not going to now go and convince everyone I have an authority in my house. I can enforce my authority in my house. Hallelujah. I can come on a Sunday, I can tell you to do it, but I can't force you to do it. I'm just merely giving you the, uh, the word of God, and then you have to make a choice. Obedience. Hallelujah. Amen. Last one. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. The Bible says, God speaks of the obedience of God's word. And he starts to speak on the obedience of God's word, how important it is to obey God's word and then he goes one step further and he says it is likened unto a man that will build his house on the sand and when the winds of this world comes it will blow his house away now we all know the story of the big bad wolf up and up and blow the house away and so Jesus was saying that if a man will not or a woman will not hear the word of God and do it it will be like someone who builds their house on sand the things that you have will never have endurance. Your blessings will never have endurance. But he who believes the word of God, who reads it and believes it, will be like a man who builds his house on a rock. Then the winds of this world can blow. Then the coronavirus can come. Then the second lockdown can come. The fourth lockdown can come. It means nothing. Because you are built on a rock. That's what Jesus was trying to say. 
But if you are building your, your job, your house on your ability and your strength, it has no depth, it has no root. And when the storms of this world come, when the coronavirus comes, when COVID-19 comes and knocks on your door, it will blow down whatever you have built. But if your business, if your job, if your family, your house is built on the word of God, the Bible says it shall not fall. And so if I build my entire family on the word of God, on the promises of God, I know that God will protect it. And if he doesn't protect it, that means that I'm, I'm, I'm missing totally. Because then the whole Bible is a lie. That's how your faith must be. Your faith must be like a potato. You must be able to feel it. Hallelujah. You must touch it. You must know that it's real. When I speak of this Bible, I know it has power in my life. I don't just say it is written. I say it is written. Full stop. If the Bible says that, that's what it is, and that's what I believe it is. You don't need the Bible doesn't Jesus notice what Jesus said. He never said you must be perfect. He never said you must be all righteous and all holy. He just said you must believe my word. I believe even if we are falling short, the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 3 that there are none perfect and none righteous among us. There is no righteous man and woman. All have fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with some sin in your life. It doesn't matter whether you are just trying to find your way in this world. Jesus is only asking you that you believe his word. You can still believe his word. Maybe you back in with nicotine, or you back in with you, you drink in a glass of wine now and then, or maybe some other brother is, is back in with anger, or someone else is back in with sexual immorality or something. I'm not condoning the sin, but I'm saying even in your sin, if you start to believe the word of God, it will have the power to help you. That's what God is saying. God never called us to be perfect to come to you. Maybe you had a fight with your, with, your, with your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your fiancé. Maybe you had a fight and you said some things and you feel condemned. God is saying even in that day, if you will trust my word, it will have power in your life. God never asks us to be perfect. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So I just want to go to the book of Luke. The book of Luke chapter 4. I just want you to set the foundation with the word of God. So you'll, you'll see it in the word, the power of God's word. We live in a time of obedience to this word. Listen to the book of Luke chapter 4. Then Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward when they had entered, ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stones to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, take, uh, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, For you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give the angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. That's very good. I want to focus on that. And it tells me something. In the book of Luke chapter 4, it starts with Jesus being in, in the desert. 
and he was fasting. So that means God was speaking some stuff to him. Hallelujah. Have you ever fasted? Have you ever separated yourself for a long time unto the Lord? You cannot come out of that fast without anything from the Lord. So Jesus was pregnant with destiny. When he came out of that fast, Jesus was pregnant with his destiny. He had the, he had the DNA of his call inside of him. And that's when the tempter will come. The tempter will not come when you are when you are walking off the, the call of God, when you are pregnant with the destiny of God, when you are about to birth what God wants in your life, that's when he will come and tempt you. And Jesus came. So for the verse 1, it speaks of the, the Jesus receiving all the blessings and the mandate of his call. And then from verse 2 to verse 13, we find that the enemy came to tempt him. How did he tempt him? He tempted him to cause doubt on the word of God. Nothing else. He said, if you are the son of God, are you sure you are the son of God? Are you sure God blessed you? Has God ever promised you bread or something? And then you, when you went through that season, somewhere along the line you face some storms. And it's in that storm that he will come. But in that storm you are pregnant. With the destiny and the blessings of God. And he will come and he will whisper. Are you sure? Can you see the surroundings? He probably came to Abraham in Canaan. And when Abraham stepped into Canaan with the obedience of God. And it was famine. The enemy probably came and said. Abraham can you see what's going on around you? Are you sure you heard this God? Because he said that he's going to bless you. But this, this land doesn't seem blessing to me. So what he does is. The enemy, oh, I'm going to say something. The enemy is not after your cars and your houses. I hear Christians say, oh, the devil attacking my car. Oh, the devil is attacking my house. The devil is attacking my family. We give him too much glory. He has no power. Yes. You know what he's after? The enemy comes to steal the promises of God in your life. He comes to steal this word. When he steals the word from your heart, he steals your destiny. And your car and your house and your blessings are wrapped up in the destiny of God. When you step out of your destiny, you lose your house, you lose cars, you lose blessings. The enemy is not concerned about that. He wants to destroy you. The, the Bible says in the book of John chapter 10 verse 10 that the enemy has one or one uh, aim in his life. is to steal, to kill and not to just steal. He wants to destroy you. So he's not worried about your little car. He's not worried about your house. He's not worried about your finance. He's worried about the destiny of God. He's worried about the word of God that was implanted into your soul that has the power to accomplish all God has for you. He wants your faith. That's what he wants. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. If he can steal your faith, he will destroy everything in your life. And your faith is birthed in the word of God. If he can cause you to doubt God's word, he will steal your faith. If he cause you to doubt that God is the supreme God. If he can cause you to doubt that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. If he is the almighty God, if you can doubt that, he has robbed you of your destiny. Because without the promises of God, you can accomplish nothing on the earth. That's what he's after. And when Jesus was pregnant with the mandate of heaven to redeem mankind, the enemy came. Jesus had nothing. Jesus didn't have food to eat. The Bible says he was hungry. He just came up 40 days from the desert. So the enemy is not concerned about what you have. And naturally, he's concerned about your destiny inside of you. I want to tell you when I was a young man, the destiny of God was burning inside of me. The enemy came and planted doubt and tried to forfeit the destiny of God by getting me addicted to drugs. I was young and immature. I got involved in all of these things. He took me to, to prison and he tried to forfeit what God has put inside of me. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace. That there came a day when he reignited the word of God in my heart and I started to believe him again. On the first of July 2001 at 10.45 in 46 Blow Street in Kensington, Johannesburg. My wife and I, something happened to us 
in that altar. What happened? We just started to believe again. Amen. The word of God started to have power in our life again. Amen. I started to believe that there is this God of my mother that she spoke about. He's actually real. That's all God wants for you. That's what the enemy tried to come to Jesus and steal the word of God. He will steal your faith and he will steal the promises of God and everything else that comes with it. Hallelujah. Yeah. If you read in the book of um, the, the parable of the sower, in, um, in the book of Luke, we read of the parable of the sower. And the Bible says that when the word is sown, the enemy comes to steal it. You remember that? Yes. When Jesus was explaining the parable of the sower, he says, because when, when the enemy comes, he comes to steal it. Why? Because the word carries the promises of God for your life. He's not worried about anything else. He's worried about the word in your heart. You want to test it today? As soon as we leave this uh, church, half an hour later, when you get home, just before you eat lunch, try this with your family. Ask someone, what did pastor speak about today? Even if you are in church, screaming, hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory, you're listening to it now because you receive words of destiny. But if you don't learn how to seal it in your heart, cover it with the Holy Spirit, it will be stolen quickly. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said the word of God carries and is pregnant with your destiny. It's pregnant with hope and with faith. And as soon as you leave here, the enemy is coming to steal it. Why? Because he knows that you will spend enough time in the promises of God. Your faith is going to be so strong that he will never have power over you. That's what happened with Jesus. He tried to tell Jesus. He tried to cause Jesus to doubt the word of God. Remember all he was saying? Every, every temptation that the enemy came to Jesus was the scripture. He tried to manipulate the scripture. But Jesus retaliated with the word of God. And he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. That is your power in this world. You should believe this word with all that you are. Amen. And never doubt it. Don't try to explain it. You'll waste your time. Just live by it. Just believe it with all that you are. Even man will think that you are a fool. Sometimes when I speak to people, I get so frustrated trying to convince it. All I can tell him is, it is written. I will believe God's word. Why? Because it is written. Simple answer. That's what Jesus said. The devil was going to come with his, with his uh, manipulating styles and tell, Oh, if you are the son of God, call this uh, uh, stone into uh, a bread. And then Jesus now is going to start to go through all the scriptures and try to explain. He just realized this guy is never going to believe me. And he just told him it is written. It is written. Sometimes we need to do that. When God speaks in our life, we just follow it, we trust it, and we build our faith, and we walk, and we possess what God has for us, and the enemy has no power over that kind of faith. And then he left him for an opportune time. Why? He realized this man here, yeah, he trusts the word of God. I can't cause him to doubt the promises of God. That's all. That's your greatest weapon in this world. You don't need to go pray 20 hours a day. You need to believe God's word. But imagine if you pray 20 hours a day and believe in his word, what would you do? Huh? You just need to trust God by his word. And the enemy will leave you. He'll flee from you. The Bible says he fled from Jesus until an opportune time. What is an opportune time? He'll wait for a time where your faith is not so strong. How does your faith get to the weak? By not reading the word of God. This is why I always tell them, read the word of God. This is why Jesus told Joshua, in the book of Joshua chapter 1, he said, meditate on this word of God. First he told Joshua, be courageous and meditate on the word of God day and night. Do not allow it to depart from your heart. Then your heart shall be prosperous. And you shall be successful in whatever you do. Amen. As long as the promises of God, as long as the Bible and what God's promise in your life is standing strong, 
Nothing can steal your destiny. Nothing. It's a simple thing. How much more simple must we get? Believe this God. Trust Him with all that you are. Look at Samuel. You read the book of so 1 Samuel chapter 14. From around verse 22. Before and after that, around that verse, you hear the story where God told Samuel, uh, Saul, Saul was just anointed as king of Israel. And God gave him an instruction through the prophet. The word of God came into Samuel's life. And God told him, I want you to go in and attack the Amalek uh, here. I don't know who I'm talking about, it's on the screen. That word, that king. Malek or something. Amalek. Praise the Lord. And he told him, now go and attack this king. But I want you, there's some instructions in between. And this is where we fall wrong with God. We like the word of God that says, if God is for me, no one can be against me. A thousand can fall on my side and ten thousand by my right, but none shall come near me. We like all that. But when God says, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. <laughs> Depart from evil. Walk not and dwell not in the tent of the unrighteous. We don't like that. Now Saul liked being, you are the king of Israel. Praise the Lord, I am the king of Israel. He liked that. But he didn't like when God gave him instructions. And God told him, go in and attack the Amalekites. And kill everything. Destroy everything. Don't take nothing for yourself. And as he was on his way to the battle. Now I'm telling you all the story that the Bible does say. As he was on the way to the battle, the enemy came and visited Saul. And he said, Saul, am I speaking to the right person here? Are you the king of Israel? Do you have command over this entire army? Because it doesn't seem that way to me because now you're listening to someone else telling you what to do. Who is Samuel? He's just a priest. Let the priest do their priest work. Sometimes when I speak to people in business or in their life, they probably think, pastor is a priest. You go preach the word, let me live my life. And that's what he was saying. What does Samuel got? What is he coming and telling you about armies and things? What does he know? You go and you be the king of Israel. You go and plunder this kingdom and you take that plunder for yourself. What happened in that walk to the battle? The enemy convinced Saul that the promises of God was not legit. And that's what happens in our lives. When God gives us a promise, we have the heart to do it, but along the way the enemy is going to come. And he's going to make you doubt the promise of God. He's going to make you doubt what God promised you. And in doubting, you forfeit your destiny. And the Bible says that Saul disobeyed. And he kept the, the fat of the lambs, the best of the lambs. And he justified it. You go read the Bible. He justified it. And when the Samuel came, when the prophet of God, God is not a fool, God knows everything. Samuel came, he said, What is this noise I hear of the sheep here? He already knew it. God told him. And Saul tried to cover up and go. Saul said, mm, You know what? We brought all these good lambs, you know, because we want to put a sacrifice unto God. God don't need your sacrifice in your disobedience. It doesn't matter how much of sacrifice you give God. As long as you disobey His word, you will lose His grace. And Saul said, no, oh, we, we do. Uh, what he was actually telling the prophet, we disobey God. God was a bit wrong. You know, God didn't think. He maybe was fasting too long or something. His mind is not thinking properly. Or this prophet, he maybe was uh, isolated too long. He's not thinking correctly. We did a good thing. Don't worry. We killed this nation as God told us to, to destroy them. But we brought something. It's a good thing. Look what we're giving. We're giving the best lands to God. No, God is not interested in your, your... As I always tell people, you can write a check of a million rand and throw it in the basket. God is not impressed with that. If you disobey His word, that offering is worth nothing to God. And that's what He told them. Oh, we're going to sacrifice... Samuel said, no, 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 you missed this whole thing. You missed this whole thing. I am, let me read that to you. I believe we need to read it. I won't read the whole thing. I can see, I'll say, oh, pastor, you told us the whole story. Now you're going to go read the whole story again. 
I'm just going to read what Samuel said to him. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of rams. So it's better to do what God tells you to do by his word. Then you can bring the best offering to God. It is your obedience that is the greatest offering to God. Hallelujah. For rebellion, oh, this is important. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So what I'm saying is, you can bring all your offering unto God, but if you do not live in accordance to this word, it is rebellion mm -hmm. unto God. And it is like a sin. That's why I say, remember what I said? We all have fallen short of the glory of God because we all don't live according to this word. Somewhere in this word, we fall short. You see that? You've got to be humble and accept it. Because you have rejected the word of God, he has also rejected you from being king. Oh, okay. you must get that revelation now. I told you all that the word of God brings your promise forth. It's pregnant with your promise. It's pregnant with your destiny. If you reject this word, you forfeit the destiny of God. So how important it is now. It's not just about being able to quote the scriptures anymore. It's carrying your destiny. And this is what he told Samuel. You have rejected the word of God. You have not believed the word of God. Now you have forfeited your destiny as king. So Saul lost his destiny because of one of disobedience. Do you see the power of God's word? When God tells you something, you must believe this thing. I don't know how my brothers and sisters, I don't know how God is going to do this. I don't know why, if his word says, that if someone strikes me on my right cheek, give them the left cheek. If God says that if someone does something bad against you, go bless them. Bless your enemy. You ever tried doing that? Did you ever try doing that? Tell me who did that. Lift your hand up. Thank God for honesty. Okay. So if you are righteous people, we are the sinners. Now I'm blessing each other. Rebecca, they've learned, you notice something. The older people are the ones that have learned that lesson. Look how old they are. They are seasoned, they are mature people that did that. All the youngsters never lift up their hands because we still need to learn. We still need to be broken. Try that. Because of why? You may ask, Pastor, why must I do that? That sounds so foolish. Because the word of God says. Amen. That's why. Do it. And you will give birth to what God has for you. Amen. Don't just do the good things. Do everything. And that's what our life should be. A pursuit of the fullness of God's promise. Amen. Day by day, we get stronger, we get wiser, and hopefully before we leave the earth, we have learned to totally believe His word. Even me as a preacher, I'm not standing here all right to say that I believe, uh, I, I pre preach it, but sometimes my flesh gets in the way, and I don't follow it 100%. Sometimes I get angry. The Bible says, do not uh, let your anger lead to sin. Sometimes my anger leads me to sin. And I say things. I get angry with my wife and I'll say things. Or I get angry with people. Or the taxi driver comes in front of me. I get angry. I sin. Don't you have righteous before me. It's a pursuit of the holiness of God. Righteousness is a gift given and salvation. Holiness is a lifestyle of pursuing the nature and the mind of Christ. Only through His Word. That is the power of God's Word. And we live in a time where we need to be obedient to this Word. We need to trust it. Why? Not to act holy. Not to come and quote the, quote the scriptures in church. Not to preach. But to give birth to what God has given Amen. us. It carries the destiny of God. It carries the DNA of your destiny. Be pregnant. The more you need the word, the more pregnant you become with the blessings of God. The more the word of God dwells inside of you, the more you meditate on the word of God day and night. The more you are more pregnant. You are you're no more in the first trimester. You move to the third, fourth trimester. You're ready to give birth. Amen. Imagine the 
It's not about family and mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. No, he's just using them as angels to get to you because he wants to steal your destiny. Because of a canning greatness. The greater the destiny, the more the attack the enemy will come. I, I know that for a fact. My wife and I, our marriage is always under attack. We have to be constantly on our watch. And we're not always on our watch. We are only human. We fall short. But we are constantly attacked. Why? Because we are carrying the destiny of God. The greater the call, the greater the mandate, the greater the attack on your marriage. And here we thought it was about cars and houses that the enemy wants. Oh, the enemy attacked my job, Pastor, pray, and I will pray for you. Send me the request, I'll still pray for you. <laughs> Pastor, pray for me, the enemy has it. And if it's you, I'm not uh, picking on you, I'm making you wife. Pastor, pray for me. The enemy stole my car. The enemy attacking my job. But you are forgetting why is he coming there. He's not after the job. He's after your destiny. Mm. Hallelujah. That is the power of this world. Amen. Living in obedience to this world will bring forth the destiny of God in your Amen. life. It's worth all the fight in this world. Yes. That's why when someone asks me, why do you believe the word of God? I tell them, because it is the word of God. Amen. It is the foundation. It is the rock upon which I am built. Yes. I don't know the composition of that rock. I only know that I'm built on that rock. And that rock will protect me. And the storms of this world have no power over yes. me. Amen. Don't ask me to explain. I don't need to explain. Yes. Do you understand that? Amen. Who told you that you need to explain why you trust Jesus? We think that our explanation of our faith will bring forth salvation. It does not. The Bible says there is only one thing that brings forth salvation. And his name is the Holy Spirit. We got this thing mixed up. You don't need to prove to anyone. We feel that pressure that we need to convince people who God is in order to bring them. No, we believe in God. We trust that he is God. And the Holy Spirit will walk through you Amen. and bring the lost to Jesus. There's wisdom for you all today. We need to understand the deep things of God. We are not living in times where we can just be immature and superficial with the things of God. You believe this God, you trust Him and He will bless you, He will bless your children, He will bless everything around you if you will just have simple faith. Simple faith. Sometimes people want me to give them extravagant answers when they ask me things. When I was young in the ministry, I used to go home and pray. Tell him, hold on. Let me go fast and pray about this question. And I want to go think of some intellectual answer, spiritual answer. Ah, those, days, those days are long gone. I don't need an intellectual answer. I need you to see the faith that I have in this God. Innocent faith. Jesus said that if you will trust me and believe me, like these children, the kingdom of God is yours. Do you understand? My brother is not your children. Man. Do they even doubt you? Does that young lady ever doubt what you say? Never. In my house, I'm the electrician, I'm the plumber, I'm the builder, I'm the mechanic, I'm the electrician. I can do anything in the house. Anything, bro. Daddy will fix it or not. Some unfixable things. Daddy, let me take it to Daddy and sort of that's the kind of faith that God wants in us. Amen. He just wants you to believe His word. How much more difficult can it be? All He says is read this word and believe it. You may fall short. You may do some wrong things. You may go off track. But even in that season, trust my word. David was a man that did wrong things. His eyes got a bit wandering in one moment in his life. He did some wrong things with a woman. I'm not saying go do it and God's going to condole it, but I'm just using David as an example. But the word of God never left his heart. Even in that time of sin, David believed God's word. Doesn't mean that you believe, uh, that you believe God's word, that you're infallible. You're not Jesus. You're not God. God don't expect that of you. He never put those standards on us. We put that standards on ourselves. 
He said, believe me. You may get angry, you may say things, you may uh, uh, say bad things even against God. You know, when I, when I was, uh, uh, I forgot of the Lord, right? But anyway, I'm interesting, let me say it. <laughs> when, when, when I was a young Christian and Pastor Jeff used to tell us, in our church, he would say, who's not in Bible school? He listened to me, I lifted up my hand one day. That was like the beginning of a long journey of study. That went on for like 10, 12 years. Innocently, I picked up my hand and I was stuck in this thing for 12 years. In the first few years, I loved God. I just got saved. I believed His word with all that I was. But I spoke some bad things against my pastor. I was angry. I was still immature. I was still learning to deal with this thing. And I said, today I, I honor Him with all that I am. I believe Him. I trust Him. He knows that. But in those days, I said something. But God didn't judge me. He understood that I, I, I don't understand the full picture. Don't put those standards on yourself. You just believe His word. That's all you need to do. Start reading His word. Start from the book of Matthew if you haven't read the Bible yet. Start from the book of Matthew. If you start in Genesis, you'll get frightened. <laughs> start from Matthew. Learn the grace and the mercy of this God that we serve. And then you'll learn the history of the world. <clears throat> and don't stop. Every day, read at least, even if it's one minute or two minutes, even if it's a paragraph. In our house, we read, we have prayer and we read. We don't read the whole scripture. I don't preach for one hour. I don't even preach. Every day, someone has their own turn. They read one scripture and they give us an uh, interpretation. If they, I'm not going to preach, they're going to, if it's Pastor Rachel's turn, if it's Michaela's turn or Daniela's turn, they must give the interpretation. Why? What am I doing to my family? I'm teaching them to learn the word of God for themselves. My knowledge of the word cannot bring your destiny forth. Although I love you, although I pray for you every single day, but my knowledge of the word cannot bring forth your destiny. You have to claim your destiny. Even my wife has to claim her own destiny. I can protect her, but I can't but Did you notice? Hannah couldn't, uh, how can I could not bring forth Samuel? Hannah had to bring forth Samuel. He positioned her in the temple. He prayed for his wife. He covered her with prayer, but Hannah needed to go to God. You need to go. Husband and wife, when it goes to the throne room of God, there is a similarity over there. Unfortunately, you have to go alone in the presence of God. There is no room for anyone else. Every man and every woman must stand before their God. Naked before your God. I love her, I pray for her, but I can't take her there. It is her job to go. Are you all getting what I'm saying this morning? I'm showing you that we are just a family like any other family. We not, I don't live in heaven. I don't walk with God's angels every day. I face the same storms that you face. But they are principles. The word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Read the word every day. Trust God. And give birth to your destiny. Remember what I said as I close? God showed me clearly of the things that are coming. We trust, we pray that God will cause it to pass. But we need to be obedient to His word. And He says in this day, we need to trust Him by His word. Unmovable, unshakable. Do what you have to do. But in all that you are doing, trust God. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Do what you can do, and God will do the rest. Don't get stressed now. Don't go. And I'm not saying go and start buying on those credit cards and start stocking. I'm not saying that. I'm saying believe God. Let Him direct you. Let Him lead you in what you need to do. But there are times coming upon the earth. Don't live ignorant. I want to tell you something right now. The church is living ignorant. People think that it's okay not to go to church. People think it's okay. Even this thing... Um, I know some people are because of sickness they are at home but there are some people that are using this online thing as an excuse yeah. I'm telling you it's going to become a trap to the body of Christ yeah. I hear the Lord say it was for a season you see if God gives you something for a season 
Like God gave us that uh, outlet, the church outside, the drive-in church for a season. Yeah. Many people were unhappy with me when I came into the church. But when you prolong a season, it becomes a curse unto you. Yeah. It becomes an idol you start to worship. Yeah. And many people are sitting, if it, uh, as I said, some people are sick, I accept they have to stay at home, it's safer. But there are people that are using the online church for nothing. They're just using it as laziness, just to sit at home and, oh, I don't need to go to church today, I can just watch it online. Yeah. That was a season. And that season is gone. If God, if, if we get back into lockdown, then we go back to that season. But we got the freedom to come to God's house. Amen. Yes. The book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 21 to 25 says, Do not forsake the gathering together of brethren as some do, even so as the end comes here. Yes. Uh, there's a word of God. Yeah. We must honor this word and we must acknowledge it. Hallelujah. So we need we need to trust God's word right now. Hallelujah. May that be a word for those online, those maybe there's pastors online that are uh, think it's fine not to have the word the, the church going. I want to tell you something, my brothers and sisters, as a prophet of God, you better open your church. Yes. You better get people in there, even if it's 200 people, you make a plan and you open the doors of that house. Yes. You make sure the house of God is burning in a time such as this because there's coming a season where the house of God shall not only give spiritual food but it shall also give natural food to my people. People will come to my house for food. There is coming a season where the house of God will become a, a, a hope of life, a beacon of life even in communities. And I will bless my house and I will cause my house to become a storehouse. Do you not hear the word of the Lord? There was a season when I raised up my servant Joseph and I caused him not to give spiritual food but he gave natural food to my people. It was a time when my people needed it. There was money they had but the food was scarce. and so shall it be in this day say the spirit of the Lord that there will be money but there will be no food to buy. In that day I will cause my church to become a storehouse even as Joseph made a big storehouse of my churches shall become storehouses and my people shall not go hungry. My people shall have food in a time of famine, God said. So go and open my house and let me fill the back, says the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord, men of God. Hear the word of the Lord. I tell you something, there will be a time in this church where people will be lining up outside not to hear me preach, but to get a packet of rice. And I want to tell you something further. There will be plenty in the backs of this church. Yeah. Everyone, why? Because I have heard the voice of the Lord. Amen. And I am starting to prepare. Amen. It is about obedience. Not sacrifice. Let's get talking. Father, I thank you for everyone online. I just want to give out a, a call of salvation. Even in this church, if you have never known this Jesus I'm talking about, if his word has no power in your heart, the Bible says to every believer, this word should be unfallible and, and unshakable. But to those that are perishing, they do not know the power of his word. Maybe you're online, maybe you're in this church, and maybe the word of God does not have that power in your life. Maybe when they say it is written, it doesn't have that strength. I want to give you that opportunity this morning. If you will receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that you will be saved. And this word of God will come and abide inside of you. And it will become the standard of your life. And it will be the rock upon which you are built. If that's you, if that's you in this church, you can look to your hands if you have not known Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You online, say this prayer with me. The Bible says that if you will believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and if you will believe that God rose him from the dead that you shall be saved. And this word, Jesus Christ shall come and live inside of you. Lord, I bring every soul that is closing their eyes right now. I bring every man and woman anywhere in the world that is by, by the chance of heaven watching this broadcast right now. I send forth the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Lord, draw them now unto the glory of God. Draw them to you, Lord. I want you to say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, 
I believe that you are the son of God. And I believe that God rose you from the dead. Forgive me of all the sins that I do. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and be my Lord and be my Savior. And guide me by the power of your word from this day on. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I just want to welcome you in the kingdom of God. The Bible says that if you have said that prayer, that you are saved. You need to find the Bible-based church and go and learn the promises of God. The world has said that you are a mistake, but today a new destiny has been born in your life. Hallelujah. Go find out what God has for you. Start reading His Word. If you don't have a church to go to, you can you're more than welcome to come to 42 Main Service Road in Kedra Park and join ministries and we will teach you how to walk in the destiny of God. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you. May He keep you. We'll see you on Wednesday at 7 to 8 p.m. for an hour of power in the name of Jesus. Amen.